Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. This is Evan Holliday, your host, and today we have on the show with us a special guest, Jim Mafuccio. Jim, great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Doing great, Evan. It's, it's good to be with you here. Yes, likewise. Um, I, I was just telling Jim before we hopped on here, I am really, really excited about today's episode because this is something I, the topic today is genuinely something I know very little about. Um, so I'm excited to dive into this. Uh, a little background on Jim and what he does before we dive in. Uh, he has really enjoyed a long, successful career in real estate and has some battle scars to prove it. I want to hear more about that once we dive in, Jim. Uh, he's the founder and principal of Aspen Funds, uh, drawing on over 30 years of real estate experience and ha- is become an expert of mortgage notes and is helping investors earn high yields every month without the built-in volatility of traditional investment options. And so with that, Jim, let's just dive right in and a little bit of your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, you bet. Well, it's good to be here with you, you and your your audience. So uh yeah, so I uh, actually, my, I, I began my career as a civil engineer. I graduated from LSU, go Tigers. And uh, that was in 1979 and um, went to work for the biggest, actually the largest corporation in the world at the time, an oil company in 1980 as, as a project engineer with a civil engineering degree. After about five years of that, I realized I really wasn't the, the corporate type and the entrepreneurial bug kind of bit. So I, while I was still employed, I, I got my real estate license, got my first two or three transactions under contract as an agent um, before I turned in my resignation. Cause I realized, man, I'm gonna make more income from these three deals than it take me almost a half a year. Uh, and this is, I was in Ventura County in California at the time. And so I thought this is gonna be great, you know? So, <laughs> so I pulled the plug, jumped out of the plane and. And within about a week after resigning, two of those deals went south <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like, whoa. <laughs> and so anyway, it's been kind of a walk of faith uh, since that point in time. But I, that was 1986 was the January of 86 was the last paycheck I ever got from somebody. So I've been, I've been self-employed wow. for, for that long, so what, 34 years and uh, had some, uh, had some ups and had some significant downs and Mostly, I was involved uh, in the early couple decades of my career as a, as a developer doing residential development in, um, in and around Southern California. And, um, you know, I learned a whole lot about how, uh, you know, how debt plays into real estate investing, especially the development world and, and, and you know, especially in a situation like coastal markets where, you know, there's so many different overlays of, uh, of regulation and political pressure to not develop. And uh, so the, the bottom line of all that is it's very expensive to develop and it takes a long time. And, and uh, the problem with that is you don't really know what the market's going to look like by the time you have your project ready to, you know, hopefully monetize your efforts from the last three or four years. So, so I, um, and, and what I kind of development was that? Residential. Yeah. So okay. we were doing infill, uh, small development, family. U- using private yeah. money, mostly uh because we weren't bankable when we first started off you know we're a couple of mid you know late 20s i don't guys. think anybody is <laughs> yeah so uh it's gotten a little easier actually in, in the you know recent decades but yeah back then it was like friends and family put together a fund get a hard money loan you know and, and do the thing and so anyway um because of the timing element uh you know again you you know if you if you caught the wrong timing if you caught the wave wrong you went under and so that happened to me twice, actually. I didn't get enough the first time. So in the mid nineties, I had a project that was a huge success on paper, uh, won a gold nugget award for it. Had everybody, it was a, did this old fashioned craftsman style home development and got all kinds of press, had all kinds of people come look at the project and it was great, except that we ended up losing the last uh, phase of the houses and vacant lots to foreclosure. And so it was, a, it was the most successful failure I've ever had. And then, uh, you know, then I start. I got jumped back in and got involved in developing affordable housing, and thought, okay, this, this, this is what the smart people will do. So I was yeah. developing homes a hundred thousand dollars less than 
what the nearest competition was. And then we hit the, uh, you know, the mortgage crisis <laughs> and uh, pretty hard to believe, but, but even as, even at those price points, that market dropped so precipitously that once again, we ultimately had to turn everything over to the lenders. And so it really was a debt-based um, failure twice. So obviously if you have the, you know, capital and staying power, you know, now the homes that literally some of the homes, I watched them sell at the courthouse steps for $125,000. Our costs in were in the low 200s. Huh. I watched them sell for almost 50% of cost at the courthouse wow. steps. And those homes now are going in the $400,000 range. So it's all about timing when you have the alligator coming after you called debt. So, yeah. um, so I, I found myself in a, a situation moving to the Midwest with my wife and five teenagers at the time, 100% broke. Oh. I mean, even beyond broke, underwater, uh, difficult trying times, but I just figured, okay, well, I'll just do what everybody else is doing right now because I, I need to create a some kind of a paycheck. So I just started flipping houses in uh, Kansas City, had to start all over with new investors and new contractors and the whole bit. And, you know, that, that was it was kind of keeping food on the table, nothing fancy. But um, for, from about 2008 to 10, and in 2010, I went to a conference. A friend actually comped me a ticket. I don't think I could have gone otherwise. It was in Denver. And so um, I ended up flying out to Denver and going to this conference on distressed debt, buying defaulted mortgages, because I figured, well, you know, you know these, these institutions are, are hemorrhaging this paper. If they don't get rid of it, they go, they go under. So uh, anyway, I had my eyes opened up and realized, you know, uh, kind of had an epiphany that the, uh, the, the dynamics of debt that took me down, the, th that same equation, if I got on the other side of it, it would be my, it would be my recovery. So, um, so I started studying in 2010 and uh, in 2011, I bought my first uh, mortgages, a handful of mortgages, with new investors, friends and family kind of thing. And, uh, did the first three or four and realized, man, this is good. What I was doing is I was actually buying non-performing second mortgages, which people told me I was huh. insane, you know, um, but non-performing second mortgages, but, but I would look for ones where the senior mortgage was performing. So, uh, so I know that the homeowners in the home, they're taken care of, it, they're employed. Yeah. So, so really, uh, you know, in these seconds, the institutions just don't know what to do with them. They got to charge them off and they're not going to foreclose from second. They're not going to spend a lot of time trying to work them out. So how do these second mortgages get there in the first place? You mean, you mean how to, from the borrower's perspective? Uh-huh. Well, just somebody buys a house and they don't want to pay PMI. So they get a, a piggy, what's called a piggyback loan, a 80% uh -huh. first. They used to call it an 80-10-10 program, for instance. Or somebody's been in the home a while, and uh, they've built up some okay. equity above their first, and they say, "Hey, I yeah. want to let's go buy some stuff." So they refinance, and of course, yeah. money was really free and easy in the 04, 05, 06, and the market was going like this. So, yeah. so you had a lot of this paper, and then you know, so people started defaulting on these seconds, and you know, after about 90, 120 days or whatever, they they I think they probably realized we're not getting called by the bank anymore. They're leaving us alone. Maybe this is going away. And so, and so these institutions, I mean, they didn't, they weren't even actively marketing these seconds. They just kind of put them in the underwear drawer and, you know, just kind of forgot just, about them. You kind of forgot about them. Yeah. So, wow. So I found, you know, some, some folks that were involved in this little niche within a niche and, yeah. and started buying these and realizing, man, alive, we're buying these at pennies on the dollar and, and, and really having the opportunity to solve, you know, really create a win-win-win situation. First of all, I, I had to win because I had to feed my family. But secondly, these institutions have this stuff on their books. They got to get it off. So, they, so you know, they win. And then the homeowner actually wins because they do have this lien on their property and they do have, they do owe yeah. us money. But since we're buying them at such good price points, we can typically work something out with the homeowner that's just phenomenal for them. So they're in, a, they're in an affordable payment structure. Huh. And that's, that's mostly what we do. They're in an affordable uh, payment structure. In a lot of cases, we forgive a good bit of the debt and they can get back into an equity position pretty easily with us. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I started by myself. My son actually was crunching data for me, you know, in my basement in Kansas City, literally. 
And uh, <laughs> in 2011, 2012, I serendipitously en ended up catching coffee with a guy that I knew. I knew him actually through a ministry that he was involved in. And uh, he called me up one day and said, hey, let's go, uh, let's go grab coffee. I'd like to find out what it is that you do. And I said, what do you do? I said, well, I buy non-performing second mortgages. And he goes, well, okay. Anyway, let's talk about something else because you, you, you got to be <laughs> insane, you know? So I said, well, give me five minutes to explain my model to you. Maybe you'll change your mind. And so he, he's, the lights came on when he saw the numbers and the dynamics of it. And the long story short is he ended up saying, hey, well, I'm kind of in between gigs right now myself, looking for the next thing to do. Now, he had built a super successful tech company in the mid 90s in, in, the, in the Midwest. It was actually the fastest growing tech company. And he won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And, and uh, you know, so he really was, was good at building a business larger. And, but he was, he was kind of looking for the next, his next rodeo. And, and so uh, he and his wife prayed about it, talked about it and said, hey, we want to do this thing with you. So uh, he said, I'll go raise the money and I'll, I'll take care of all the, I'll do the kind of CFO function and in the, the business side of it, you just go find and do the deals. And I said, man, that's, huh. that's actually sounds pretty sweet to me. That's the part I actually enjoy the most. So, um, so I, we started off, we put our first fund together in 2014, 2013. I worked out those loans in 2014. And then we realized we got to, we got to go and thing here. Let's scale this business. And so here we are about seven, uh, six or seven serial funds later. And now we have a company of about 25 people. And uh, we've, we've just been growing like gangbusters and, and all we're still focused on second mortgages. That's really all we've had to do. And our, our, we've, we've really got it down to a, a, an art and a science at this point. So, so we're scaling this business. We're going to be jumping into some other lines. We'll be doing some senior debt as well shortly, but so we've gotten some institutional money behind us. We've we actually made the Inc. five thousand fastest growing small or privately held businesses, and we're, we're congratulations. Looking to, yeah, thank you. We're looking to get a zero off of that, so it's Inc. five hundred here shortly. But, <laughs> but no, it's been a lot of fun. I have two of my sons working for us. Uh, my partner, two of his kids work for us. Our our, our senior vice president of finance is his, is his oldest son, and so we're, it's a it's kind of a family business plus some. We have a great time and uh, it's, you know, this is my third time up the mountain and I think it's going to, I think it's going to stick this time after going through a couple pretty deep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that's, this uh, season we're in. That's an amazing story. I love to hear how, <clears throat> you know, you went through many iterations and many, many learning cycles. And uh, like you said, many peaks and valleys of, of learning the business, learning different businesses, you know, trying and failing and, and being a, kind of a byproduct of the system and then yeah. learning how to almost like create your own system or, or create a better system where you could be a part of uh, the debt side of the equation and also be part of the solution where you said, where it's a win, win, win for yeah. yourself, the bank and the homeowners. Um, but I, I'm really excited because I've, I've, I've heard of people doing this. I really haven't known enough about it, but I, I'm curious, like diving into the front end, like when you were first getting started, you said 2011, you got started. How did you go about and buy that first um, second lien mortgage? Yeah. So, you know, in the beginning, it was 100% conferences. I literally, people that I met at that very first conference in Denver yeah. ended up coming to work for me hmm. and helping build a business. Uh, the, and then it was one of the second, maybe second or third note conference I went to. Uh, I, I met, met a, a company, a, a, a fund that was actually selling second mortgage. Now, mind you, most everybody was doing first mortgages. So it was a very yeah. small microcosm of people that were doing seconds. And I found this one group that was, had somebody out, had a table set up out in the, in the hallway, you know, and yeah. I, I just got into a conversation with this gentleman and, and, uh, and I ended up, you know, doing a deal. And I, mean, I probably drove him crazy with all my questions because I'm, you know, that engineering background, plus having a couple of big failures behind me and brand new investors. I'm not about to blow it. Right. So, <laughs> so he walked me through the process and, you know, I, so I, I bought three loans from, I think I, the total buy was like, uh, I think $40,000 for these three seconds. And that represented a, you know, payoff balance of maybe $120,000. And, and so, uh, you know, I was off to the races with those. So the, the short answer is conferences. Now I got to tell you a cool story. 
because that guy ended up, you know, I found out later, like a couple years down the road doing business with, with his firm. Um, I found out later that, that he found out, I told him up front, these are the first loans I'm buying. Well, I found out later, they were the first loans he was selling. <laughs> and and the, the cool wow. part of the story is he ended up, you know, his, his, his wife ended up, had some money in an Irish, she ended up investing in, in our fund while he was still hmm. working for this other outfit. And, and then about a year later, we actually made him an offer because the other company was kind of going sideways and going out of business. Well, he's our acquisitions director to this day. And I mean, just a, he's become a great friend and such a key part of our, our business. Yeah. And so, so it, but it all came from going to these conferences and, you know, uh, thank God that was all pre COVID, you know, we, yeah. we do a lot of stuff virtual now, obviously, yeah. but, uh, you know, I mean, we, we hired people, we found our sources, we found our vendors by, by going to the sources. So we live in a time right now where, I mean, nobody has an excuse as far as, you know, how do I figure out how to do something? I mean, you're, you're a couple mouse clicks away from the right people that can guide you through the process. And from, you know, you can, you can get embedded into a network through meetups, through LinkedIn, yeah. through conferences, you know, within a week, you can be completely plugged in. And then you just have to build relationships and show credibility. You have to, you know, you have to be a man of your word and all that. So. But, yeah. I yeah. love that. I love that. It started from a conference. Cause um, I, I think a lot of people go to conferences, you know, maybe, maybe hoping for, you know, a magic pill, but really it just comes down to like conversations you have in the hallways or, you know, people you talk to building that network, building the, the ability to learn from others that are there. Um, and it's not always just about the, the sessions as much as it is the network. Yeah, you're, you're so right. I mean, the sessions are good, but, but the materials that you could take home and study. And then of course, you know, people don't typically get up on a stage and tell you about their, you know, the, all the reasons you shouldn't be in the business. And I could give <laughs> people a lot of cautions, you know, and a lot of, uh, you know, if you're going to jump into this, I'm not going to just tell you about the, you know, the, the glories and the, and the victories, you know, there's, I mean, I've been sued for almost everything under the sun. It's, you, you got to have a kind of a thick skin and, uh, and obviously you got to do, you got to do right by people. We're very mm -hmm. compliance minded. We're actually licensed now in every state. We've got a bank, national bank that has taken us on that they're our trustee. So um, we, we ride on their licenses. Plus we've gotten a lot of collector's licenses and lender's licenses ourselves, state by state by state. So there's a lot of where it's a, it's a highly regulated space. It's, uh, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's super lucrative if, uh, if you make the commitment and jump in. So, you know. So walk us through. So after the conference, you bought your first few second mortgages. Right. Um, it, what, what was the process of working through those mortgages? So it sounds like you, you got them at a pretty steep discount based on their actual lien right. value or what did you call it? The, the book well, value the, or the unpaid principal balance, we call the UPB and then the pay yeah. the total payoff balance is, is that principal plus whatever arrears there are. Got so, it. you know, a lot of these people hadn't made a payment in five, yeah. six, even 10 years. So there's a lot wow. of arrears and we usually end up forgiving a lot of that if on a, on a progressive basis. So, so our, 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 and I'm going to tell you kind of what the generic uh, triage is because yeah. the way I did it in the beginning, I mean, it was, it was, it was the wild west and I literally was calling up borrowers myself. Nobody does that. Nobody, I shouldn't say there's a lot of people that still do it. <laughs> we hired a team of people and there are actually third party vendors that'll do your, yeah. your, your outreach for you. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's pretty stiff fines for saying the wrong things. I mean, you can have the best of heart and best of intentions, but if you say the wrong things to a borrower and there's things that you don't say, you don't let them know like, Hey, by the way, there's a thing called statute of limitations and your debt might be time barred. Having said that, I'm here to collect, you know, <laughs> so there's, a, you, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest somebody get involved in this and do it yourself. And you don't, the good news is you don't have to anymore. And again, you go to these conferences and you can find vendors that'll pretty much do everything for you. Um, and then of course you want to use a licensed servicer and they're the ones that actually send the statements out to your borrowers, just like your mortgage statement you get at home. That, that's mm -hmm. not coming from your lender. That's coming from a, a loan servicing company. Yeah. Sometimes it's the same as the lender, usually not. So uh, 
you know, that that's so you so you begin the process, you get the loan boarded with your servicer, and then you begin the outreach to the borrower. And you know, a lot of times you're the last person they want to hear from. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it happens every now and then where they say, Oh, well, you know what? We've been wondering if we would hear somebody. We stopped getting the letters from you know Wells yeah. Fargo and and didn't know where to send the payment, but we've we've gotten back on top now and we've we're we're reemployed and we have equity in the property. Where do I send the payment? And sometimes it's send me a payoff statement and we get a payoff, a full payoff, yeah, or we'll wow. give them a discounted payoff. So, but it's really all about engaging uh, the borrower and uh, having a meaningful conversation and, uh, and then really trying to figure out what's the best exit strategy here. I mean, we do a, uh, you know, we do a full financial intake package, just like a banquet. We, we do an underwriting uh, process, not, not the same as a loan originator, but, uh, you know, a lot of the same elements of that, because we want to make yeah. sure the person, we don't want to set them up to fail again. You know, we want to make sure it's truly an affordable situation for them. And a lot of times, sometimes they come to the conclusion through the process, you know, why don't we just sell? We got a boatload of equity here. The, the, our interest rate on the first mortgage is too high to begin with. Sometimes they can refinance and pay us off. Sometimes they can refinance and pay us partially off. And we'll go ahead and do that with them. If we see that you don't really have enough equity to refi, but if we discount our note 70, you know, to 70 cents on the dollar, suddenly you can get a 90% refi and, and you can get rid of us, you know? Yeah. You know, why and do you want to pay 10% money when you can go to the bank and get 3% money, you know? And you're typically, you're, you're buying this at such a discount to, to book value or, or unpaid principal value exactly. that you can offer a discount and still be able to make a profit on the note. That's right. And that's right. And speed is important to us, you know, I mean, if we, cause it's, we're in a, we're in a, a velocity of capital game, you know? And so uh, we want to, we want to keep our capital working, want to buy more, buy more of these loans, work them out and move on and do the next ones. And so some of them turn into three, four, five year sagas, I, I hate to say, but most of them now we're, we're, we've gotten to where we're out of them typically in 18 months. Sometimes they can, if we have to foreclose, they can take up to three years. But I will say this too, our goal is not to foreclose. We have to yeah. start a legal process uh, way more often than we ever finish them. Um, so we, less than one and a half percent of the time, do we end up actually yeah. all the way with a foreclosure. And most of those actually are where the borrowers already kind of thrown in the towel and said, you know, I, there's nothing, there's no reason for me to stay here anymore. There's the house yeah. needs work. It's underwater, blah, blah, blah. So, so what, just curious, um, side note, what is that like to, to foreclose? If you're in a second lien position, wouldn't the first lien get first priority on any payout? Well, this is the, one of the interesting things that, you, you know, I found out when I started studying this model, that's what, that's what keeps a whole lot of people away from it is, is what you, is the perception of what you just said. Mm -hmm. In most states, in most states, we have the legal right to reinstate the senior lien. So in a sense, we've bought the mm -hmm. property subject to the existing financing. So some of these, uh, some of these firsts have very low interest rates. And we just step in and, and catch up the payments on the first, because usually they're behind on the first by the time, if it gets to the mm. point where we have to foreclose, yeah. it's typically because they, they, they can't afford the payment. Not on the paying first anybody. Either. Yeah. So we step in, make the payments. Now, some states, the first will, will accelerate the loan and say, hey, you owe us. And then we just go ahead and do what we need to do with the property between when we, when we take it and we can, we can either fix it up and put it on the market. And then, uh, you know, the, for, the, the seniors, it takes a while to foreclose, especially nowadays. So, you know, I, I know there's people out there that'll actually buy these really inexpensive seconds that are, that there's no equity in at all. And then they'll get a deed in lieu from the, uh, from the borrower, give them some cash for keys. Then they'll put a renter in the house and they'll just run the foreclosure clock on the first. And, you know, they'll rent the property for three years and then just turn the keys into the first and say, okay, well, that's not our model. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of cowboys and Indians in this, you know, in this <laughs> space. And uh, we're a little more uh, institutional than that at this point. So, we're so not interested in it. as far as, so when you got started, it was you and then your partner joined on. Um, and then you mentioned at the beginning, you were calling the individual loan holders. Um, yeah, at what borrowers. point did you start the borrowers? Did, at what point did you start growing your team and, and finding people for each of those separate, you know, kind of tasks or roles within Aspen yeah, at, at the point where we're going through the first fund, we it was about a $1.5 million 
like I said, friends and family fund. And I think we bought 110 mortgages with, you know, with that fund. And I literally was the asset manager for all of those. And uh, it was, I was working, you know, lots of hours day and night, but you know what? I hadn't, I hadn't had a, a decent year of income in at by that point in time in, you know, yeah. five or six years. And, and I was, I was happy to do it, but you know, my partner and I would get together and talk about how, man, this is incredible. We're getting killer returns on this. And I said, <laughs> he goes, we gotta, we gotta grow this. And I said, yeah, number one point of growth is we got, we got to replace me. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll manage the, the workout process, but you know, so we started, we started hiring, we hired, we brought a guy on actually that I met at the, that very first conference in Denver. He had been, he had speak, he was one of the speakers actually. Huh. And I ran into him at another conference and said, Hey, how's it? And he was working for a bank full time. And then he was, he was moonlighting. His hobby was, was doing agreements for other note investors. And so he understand these seconds I could tell. And so, so I had conversations with him throughout the next couple of years and, and asked him, Hey, how would you like to uh, come on board with us and build a workout team? And uh, we made him a really sweet offer negotiated a really good deal where he, you know, he, he was able to step over from a significant six figure salary at the bank to not really take a step backwards with us. And, and so he, he built a, a team. He, he, we added like four, four or five, uh, other collectors or workout specialists and, and put wow. these systems in place. And so, and then of course we had to start adding administrative staff and, and then yeah. we brought, uh, you know, this gentleman, Tom, that I mentioned that, that became our acquisitions director. And, and he's just such a great networker and personable guy. And, and so, uh, you know, he and I would go to conferences together and meet these note sources and just have the time of our lives, just meeting these people. And, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, we got a stellar reputation in our, in our space because we're, you know, we're just regular guys. We're not full of ourselves. At least I hope not. And, um, <laughs> and we do what we say we're going to do. You know, if we, yeah. if we say we're going to buy a pool of loans, we're not going to get to the closing table and then try to renegotiate price or do some of the other things that, that happen out there in our world. But I'd, I'd say by now, most of the, the bad actors have pretty much weeded themselves out. And it's the people we do business with are honestly, they're some of the top, they're top notch people. We really enjoy it. So so once once you you scaled up Aspen Funds, who who typically are you buying um, the the second liens from? Yeah, the, it, it ranges from other individual investors that have uh, you know come into a portfolio through whatever means. But mm-hmm. we use uh, you know there's uh, you know we're connected to some institutions through through uh, advisories and in, in uh, brokers that have worked with these you know, banks for a long time and have these well established relationships. And so, um, you know, sometimes we'll just, sometimes somebody will actually find us on LinkedIn and say, Hey, you know, I purchased some seconds back in blah, blah, blah. And actually I bought a bunch of, a, a bunch of distressed debt. Don't really want to mess with the seconds. Don't yeah. really know what to do with them to a lot of people. They're still garbage. And you know what they are on, on a amount of energy needed per payoff balance there are they're a lot of work and they're tricky it's like I, I always like to say uh you know when you work senior liens it's like playing checkers and when you work junior liens it's like playing chess because there's just that many more moving parts a lot of times yeah. we're blind we're blind to the first mortgage we don't even really know we we, we have a pretty good feel for what the balance is and we have a, a we have a decent sense that it's probably performing because there's been no foreclosure flags mm-hmm. we don't know for sure what the status is so we're, we're flying in the blind that we, but after you've done a couple thousand of these, you really start figuring out how different servicers report on credit and yeah. really what's going on. And, you know, again, yeah. when you're networked in the space, we, we, we share information with each other in, in this space. And so, you know, you, you start, you start learning the, the tricks and the traps and, you know, so um, yeah, that's. So that's- uh, yeah, I, lo- I love that you brought that up. So as far as um, working through, all these different types of deals. Uh, I love that you said it's it's chess versus checkers uh, as far as buying senior notes for second second liens. Um, because it, one of my mentors always said she's like she's like the margin is in the mystery. Uh, exactly. And when Boy, that's when so you good. can yeah, I love I love that phrase because it, it's so true. It's like what you're doing Very is true. there's a lot of mystery involved, and so you have to do a lot of like sleuthing and and figuring out details and and asking a lot of questions and digging down until you find the truth. 
You nailed um, it. That's exactly But once right. you find that out, then there's a lot of value there. Um, and it does take work, but, but it also ultimately can pay off uh, a lot better returns if you're yeah. willing to put in that work. Yeah, really good returns. And so it's a whole different investment vehicle for our investors, you know, so, and we, we, we will eventually launch because just size alone is going to, you know, re require it. And we've, you know, we've uh, honestly, we've gotten, we've gotten so good at chess and chess is such a fun game, but at some point in time, there's just a limited number of these assets. It's a very boutique -y kind of mm -hmm. play, but in the, but in the senior debt space, you know, there's always a large volume of non-performing first mortgages and uh, you, you can't generate the same kind of returns because we're not buying, you can't, you're not buying those at, you know, the kind of multiples where there's, uh, you know, the yeah. ability to make three, four, five X on your, on your capital. Yeah. So with our seconds, I mean, over a portfolio, we're, you know, we're, we're hitting between two and a quarter and two and a half X. So if we buy a million dollars worth of these loan, and this is including the throwaways, the ones that are just worth, wow. not even worth spending time on. So, now there's a lot of time and energy and a lot of chess playing that goes into yeah. generating that that 250 percent, yeah, 150 percent profit with two and 250 percent revenue, yeah. And um, but it makes for a nice payday we, that we can share with our investors, you know. But they have to be patient. It's patient money. So um, we're working on some other models where where it, you know with the first mortgages it's just a little more streamlined. But obviously yeah. the margin, it, the margins won't support the same type of investment vehicle. So, so you mentioned previously, uh, what did you say? Seven funds you guys have raised to date? Yeah, I, I, that was kind of a made up number. Let's see. We're on our fifth. We're on our fifth uh, fund on the non-performing mortgage side. We okay. also have a, uh, a fund and it's an evergreen fund for buying cash flows. So we buy uh, okay. re-performing um, mortgages, seconds and first, and we do some hard money lending out of that fund. So that's just, that's really to support our investors that, that want, they want to buy into existing cash flows at, at a good, you know, at, at a good investment to value ratio where they're well secured and well covered. And so we're literally just buying cash flows at this price point and paying our investors at this price point and making the spread. And then when those yeah. loans break, when they go into default, we have the core competencies in house to get to get them back on track or to or to move that asset off the books. Mm -hmm. So that that's a growing part of our business and that'll that'll keep on growing. So yeah, so that's I think we have six, six all together including that income fund. Yeah. So evergreen when you say that it, it, I'm assuming that just means like it's ongoing in yep. perpetuity. We're always right? raising money, we're always yeah. building that portfolio and we'll we'll continue to do so as long as there's product out there and and, huh. and frankly there's always going to be product out there cuz we can even we we even bought some seller finance notes where uh you know people you know some of the fix and flippers hmm. instead of flipping it they'll just say hey I'm going to I'm going to sell yeah. this property and keep it and put it on a seller finance note then will we come along and if the if the parameters are right and they've got some seasoning and, and we can even use their rental period. A lot of times they're a rent to own deal. And so yeah. if, if they have somebody in the property, they can show us that that renter has been in the house for two years and pay and, and they convert it to a mortgage. If we get one or two mortgage payments, we'll say, we'll buy that paper as long as yeah. our investment to value ratio is good and the yield has to make our, our hurdles. So, so there's never, there's a, there's a never ending supply. That's as opposed to our, uh, our, our non-performing or our distressed mortgage side where we're buying the non-performing mortgages, the way we've, the way we've arrived to to structure our funding there, and it really had to do with the how lumpy the deal flow is. So we had to figure out a way to. We never want to overraise capital and then have it sit. That's oh. not good. But at the same time, we don't want to miss big buying opportunities. Yeah. So we're always trying to balance the deal flow with the capital flow. So the way we've kind of decided to do that is through serial closed-end serial funds. So we'll open up a fund, you know, we just, we actually just closed one and it actually is our largest to date. It's about a $15 million fund. And then that actually includes an institutional investor that came in and took a, a senior debt position. But, you know, we raised about, uh, you know, so we raised about 7 million in private equity and then 8 million in a, in a, uh, in a private debt, you know, a, a senior debt facility. So that's a closed fund now. So that fund, we're, we're now in the deployment period where we, you know, begin acquiring these assets. And then of course, we're already working out the, the first ones that we bought. Yeah. So as, as that fund, you know, matures, then eventually those in investors get paid off plus their profits. Well, we've already got 
we're already working on the paperwork for our next fund that will open up because we have investors that didn't quite get in in time yeah. for that fund and they're saying hey you know we want to yeah. we want to we want to play you know so so as long as there's deal flow we'll keep we'll we'll open up another fund and and so we kind of have they're not really back to back funds they kind of overlap yes that's great we have a, a raise a deployment and then a harvest period in, in each of our funds so it's worked out well yeah i love that I, and congratulations on 15 million that's um uh, that's a good amount of funds to be able to go out and deploy yeah and you know the the i was a little nervous because i kind of oversee the the downstream side I, the, you know the gentleman i mentioned tom is our acquisitions director he's yeah. he's the guy that's directly out talking to sources all the time and working deals and 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 but i'm kind of in charge of all that to make sure and, and working with the the capital team which my partner kind of kind is kind of head over that and 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 so we're always like comparing like well you know <laughs> hold off, we, can we really deploy this? And so I, I, you know, we mentioned, hey, I think six to nine months we can get that money deployed. And in our pro forma really allows for that kind of a time frame and still make a good return for our investors. Well, yeah. as it turns out, we just got a, a, an early Christmas present and we're looking at, we, we actually have enough product that we're going through final due diligence right now that will completely uh, use up, it'll deplete these funds. You know, we'll probably have these funds wow. completely depleted by the middle of the first quarter. So it'll be it'll be a rock and roll return for our investors because obviously you're in your your IRR yeah immediate use of capital when you shorten that time frame. So that I mean this is yeah. that's perfect. I'd love to see that happens every yeah. time. But you know, anyway, we're <laughs> pretty blessed with that one. So that's awesome. Well, it sounds like you've surrounded yourself with a great team, great partners, uh, and put people the right people in the right seats um, that is, and empowered that is, them to, to make it happen. Um, just, it sounds like with, with the velocity you guys are at, uh, the momentum you guys are building is phenomenal. You know, Evan, if, if somebody had told me uh, in 2000 and I'll even say 2011, when I started buying these, I, I, I really thought this was a maybe two to three year runway and it was an opportunistic thing. And I thought, yeah. man, if I, if I can get in there and buy, a couple hundred loans and work these things out, man, that'll, that'll be a great income for me. And it would have been, but it would have driven me crazy because it would have been just <laughs> me. But if someone had told me then you'll have a company with, you know, 25 people, some of them pretty highly paid, super awesome people, a partner that really, you know, together, we've really just, like you said, put people in the right seats and, and scaled a, a fantastic business. And we've built a company around second mortgages. I mean, come on, are you kidding me? Yeah. I would have said you're, you're, you're smoking something, you know, <laughs> but, but here we are, you know, and uh, you know, we, we continue to find the product. And like I said, we've been, we've been threatening and I know it's going to happen to, to add the checkers table to the chess table. And, and cause we can do a lot more volume with that. And what we were, one of the needs I, I didn't mention at the beginning, you know, that, you know, it's a win, 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 yeah. um, but it's actually the other, the other service that we're really providing. And I know you can relate to this is, is uh, you know there's a lot of really frustrated investors out. There's a lot of passive capital that just doesn't have the, the faith in the Wall Street and the institutional stuff anymore. Oh, yeah. and I'm not saying a person shouldn't have, you know, even a significant part of their portfolio in that. But I tell you what, we went through this COVID thing. We actually have hired six people since the beginning of COVID. Yeah. Hired people, and they're you know created jobs. And and our our numbers. I mean, you can't even see if a blip in our performance right through that process, you know? Yeah. And so, so uh, it, we're, we're uncorrelated, you know, like your business model, you're, it's uncorrelated to the financial markets. I mean, there's, a, yeah. there's an indirect correlation, but I mean, it's just not like this wild ride of, yeah. you know, that you have zero control over. So, so, so serving that population of people that just need something better to do with their money. When I tell people that, you know, we're, you can make high single and low double digits, you know, on your investment, it, and literally, I mean, I could tell them, you compare the risk of what we're doing and what you're doing, you compare that to buying, you know, equities on the on the stock market, you look at the drawdown that that can and does happen in the stock market, we don't get that drawdown. Yeah. You know, if, if, if there's some kind of a crisis out there, your apartment building is not going to decrease by 50% in value overnight. Yeah, and you can exactly. sit down and explain to, to an investor, why that's the case because people need a place to live and you might get some vacancies or some delinquencies but at the end of the day you have a performing asset that's never going to go away 
So, I mean, we're, we're, we're meeting a real need out there and, uh, yeah. you know, and I, and I love it. I love to see investors, you know, come back and say, man, this is the best investment I ever made. And we've got some that have been with us from the beginning and they just yeah. get a check. It's not even in their mailbox, man. It's like ding, ding. It, it hits yeah. your account and you get the notification that of the ACH deposit that hits your account every single month. So, you know, it's, that makes me feel really good because I know there's people out there struggling to try to figure out what to do with their hard earned money and putting it in the stinking bank. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's not a good option. So. Yeah. No, I, I can hear how passionate you are about, about giving that opportunity to investors. And, and we've seen a lot of the same through COVID. Um, and, and I can echo what you're saying. We hired three people since, since Congrats, June. Man uh at holiday ventures and same reason i mean we we saw you know we're like hey this is actually we're actually coming out of this even better than before um yeah. because of that because there's way more demand for real estate now more than ever because yeah. everybody's pulling their money out of the stock markets right i mean our last couple raises for projects have just been crazy demand like literally filling it up in in 24 hours um and so wow. I completely echo that. I think there's there's a lot of demand for what we're doing with real estate and it is literally protecting the principal all you're, you're, while while and, being and able to grow jobs. your- I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think we can say enough about that. You know, uh, kind of makes me think of, and I, I'm not going to get political, but you know, like when they talk about, they found a $750 thing on one of Trump's tax returns. There's There's so many issues there, but it's like, Dude, do you have any idea how many how many people this guy's employed and his businesses have employed? Do you think he's not added back to our economy? And and there's other kind of taxes too. There's payroll taxes and there. Yeah. So I, I mean, in my little world, just to know that I've put through my lifetime, I've put yeah. you know maybe a hundred people to work in my lifetime, and that feels huge to me. You, yeah. it, it may not sound that big, but you go talk to those families that were able to buy a home and stay in a home because of the employment that my investors and me were able to provide yeah. to them. And it's like, man, it's just feels so good. So, um, you know, it, that's a, that's a, that's one of the big payoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Like I that. completely agree. Um, well, Jim, I feel like we could keep going and going. Uh, I, I've been loving our talk, but let's dive into our monumental questions. All right. What does success mean to you? Gosh, you know, uh, well, for one, um, success has to, for me, has to start at the core. So my relationships have to be right. That, that's, that's where I find my place of peace. First and foremost, my relationship with God. That's just my story you asked me. So that's where it all starts for me and starts and ends. And uh, so I keep that, I keep, I, 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 I manage that, <laughs> manage relationship doesn't sound good. I invest in that relationship. So my spiritual life, my family, relationships with my family, my business partner, the people that are close to me. Um, honestly, you, you, you make, the, you make the, the tree healthy and the fruit will come, you know? So, yeah. uh, so taking care of that. And then uh, whenever, when life is in balance, that's to me, that's success. It's finding, really, it's finding what you were made to do, what you were built to do, and then doing it with, with passion and with excellence, pursue doing it with excellence and do it with a hopeful attitude. Notice none of this that I've said has to do with dollar amounts or yeah. number of people or size of organization. To me, that's success. Yeah. So the little, the little, uh, you know, the little bush growing in a pot that has the right nutrients and is getting watered and has pretty flowers at the end of it is just as successful as these ponderosa pines that <laughs> I could show you out my window there that are 120 yeah. feet tall and have pine cones at the end of them. You know, it's it, they're they're both both highly successful. So. You find out what kind of plant you are. You get in the right environment. You, you make sure you're nourished and uh, get under the sunshine and grow. Yeah, so I balance, love that metaphor. Balance, balance and purpose are really the, the keys. Yeah, I love that. Um, what about daily habits or morning rituals that have served you well? Well, morning rituals, uh, you know, it, it, it again, again gets back to my spiritual life. I, I, have a, I have a time of prayer and a time of Bible reading. That's kind of my, uh, that's my daily centering uh, activity. And, uh, you know, love to say I'm, you know, 100% seven days a week with that, but, uh, you know, but, but most every day for the last probably 37 years, that's been my, uh, that's been my ritual, if you want to call it that. And, uh, I do try also every day to get some form of exercise and having moved here to Colorado, I, I, I literally have zero excuse. 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm <laughs> literally thinking about heading out. Uh, I think most of the snow has melted off the, the biking trails and they're probably nice and packed. And so I'll probably jump on my mountain bike this afternoon when we get done with this, uh, with this podcast. So I try to get some nice. exercise every day. And then honestly, I just, I, I just, I, I work my business, you know, I'm talking to my people yeah. and uh, every now and then, uh, you know, a problem will get escalated to me and I'll need some input and I can kind of draw from this experience base and answer some questions. And my partner and I are always looking at ways to grow the business. And so we spend some time every week talking about that. So that's kind of it. I love it. I love it. And I'm, and I'm very jealous about the mountain biking. Um, that's <laughs> one on of my, out, my favorite things to do. I mean, you know, come on, monumental. And I live in monument. So yeah, you probably figure out a way to write off the trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we got to make come it happen. Out. I love it. Um, lastly, what about favorite book or book you are currently reading? Well, that's Bible again, you know, <laughs> I'd say it, I sound like a broken record. You know, I, I honestly, I, I'm, I've kind of got the personality that to sit down and read a book. I don't read a lot of books. I start a lot of books. I uh -huh. refer to a lot of books. Uh, I kind of have this philosophy that, you know, most of the time, if, if you're reading a book, like say that has to do with business or the, or the industry that you're in, uh -huh. by the time you, the book is in print and you're reading it nowadays, it's almost old information. So I know there's principles that flow through that, but I right. have found that through uh, podcasts, through YouTube videos, yeah. through networking with people, I, I can I can get what I need to apply. I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for application in life. I'm way more of an yeah. an application person than a theorist. So that's my really lame probably excuse for being too lazy <laughs> to read books, maybe. But I, I just I like it. I, I just don't, I don't read a lot of books. I'll just be quite honest with you. Most of the I books like I read are, are theology books and that kind of thing. So. Hey, find what works for you. Um, I love it. Well, just in, in summary, uh, phenomenal conversation. Loved learning about uh, debt investments, second liens, uh, senior notes, um, how you grew your business, how you went through the peaks and the valleys uh, and how you've come out stronger than ever. Um, you guys are just having phenomenal momentum, uh, raising $15 million funds and, and continually doing serial funds. That is really cool. And that's aspirational for me as well. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that and, and diving into all that. Um, how can our monumental listeners follow you, reach out to you, get in touch with you? Yeah, best, best way to do that would just be to visit our website. And that's uh, aspenfunds.us and it's one word a-s-p-e-n-f-u-n-d-s dot u-s and uh I, I i want i do want to say up front we don't really have like training courses we're not in the education business but we're very open-handed and we'll certainly yeah. point anybody that's interested in getting involved in in the in the debt space i can personally point you to some trainers to some conferences to some groups online um if you're interested, if you're an accredited investor and you're interested in investing in our funds, you can find out about that. But again, it's for accredited investors only. So we're not, we're not soliciting funds. We really kind of do most of that organically in house. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, we're, we're just real, real people that are perfectly happy to share and encourage people in their journey, help them find, help them find their way to the next step maybe. So. I love it. Well, Jim, it's been phenomenal hearing your story and, and getting to talk to you today. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing it. And, and monumental listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode with Jim, make sure you go on social media, let others know, um, send people a text with the episode, let people know you enjoyed today's episode and share that value with others. And guys, with that, have a monumental day. Mm -hmm.